So I'd like to thank you and thank Gary, uh, Kermit, McGill. It's, it's really a great honor to be here and uh, especially fun for me to just talk about you know, what I love to do. Uh, I'm go going to talk about uh, these topics, music understanding and the future of music performance, uh, by, mostly by describing a lot of research that I've been doing uh, for, for many years. So why are, why are we interested in computers and music? Well, music exists in every human society. Computers are also becoming ubiquitous, so you know, some overlap between computing and music uh, seems inevitable. And I think that computing can make music more fun, more available, higher quality, more personal, and so it's, it's really in the, in the service of music and towards realizing uh, music that this area is interesting to me. Um, I, I got started um, in, in life, I guess, uh, being very interested uh, from early on in math and, and also in music and also in making things. And it's, it's a little hard to explain, uh, you know, really what, what goes on uh, that you know, makes you who you are, but, but uh, making things w was always uh, kind of part of the way I approached life. And then when I discovered synthesizers in high school, the idea that uh, here you could actually make sounds, you could combine these components like uh, c control over amplitude and control over uh, spectrum and control over waveforms and frequency, and put all of these things together and actually construct sound and music. That to me was uh, just unbelievable and, and mind expanding. And I discovered computers about the same time and really had the same um, kind of inspiration that computers allow you to, to make processes and to make decisions or to automate decisions. And uh, you know, the applications to music and synthesis seemed really obvious. Uh, but this was pretty early on, and I, it really wasn't until college that I even realized there was a field of computer music and people doing things and a lot of experience. But I started reading everything I could, and uh, ever since then, I think everything that I've, uh, all the research that I've done has really been motivated by my musical experiences. So as, as Gary said, I worked on computer music, uh, I mean, computer accompaniment systems, and I'll show some of that work. That was really uh, inspired and informed by my practice as a musician. Um, also, I've developed expressive programming languages for music, and again, I think having an understanding of, of what music and musical forms uh, are all about, and, and understanding the, the wide gap between what musicians think about and what programming languages uh, help you to express enabled me to uh, make some advances in programming language design. Uh, and then, of, of course, there's audacity that was motivated by, by music and, and music research. And uh, the same thing goes for current work. Uh, what I will sort of work towards in this lecture is telling you uh, about my current work, which which I'm probably overselling as the future of music performance uh, by a wide margin, but y you know you have to put these controversial titles up there to get wonderful people to stop practicing and come to a <laughs> lecture hall, so I appreciate that. And uh, uh, anyway, this work is about integrating uh, computers as into live music performance with humans, so trying to make computers um, act like musicians uh, and perform autonomously. So we'll, we'll come to that. Uh, so that's a quick introduction. What I'd like to do first is say a little about how compu computation is used in music today, uh, especially the kind of computation that the general public knows about and experiences. And then I want to talk about the things that the general public does not experience so much. Uh, these new capabilities, some of them have actually been under development for you know, as long as decades, but things that not everyone knows about. Uh, and that's kind of a hint or indication of maybe what computers can do tomorrow. And, and then I'll get to some more speculation in my current work. 
um, which I think, you know, might have some impact on music in the future. Um, so how is computation used in music today? And I'm going, going to say that there are really four uh, uh, big areas uh, where we see computation. So that's music production, musical instruments, music distribution, and music recommendation. And I'll say just a, a few words about these. So first of all, music production, um, this is, should be no surprise to anyone, but for anyone old enough to remember analog tape recorders or even uh, LPs and uh, what, what big expensive studios used to look like, it's kind of interesting to just step back and say, wow, there's nothing really left in music production other than a computer and a hard disk drive and a bunch of software. So we record everything to, uh, digitally to disk. We edit, manipulate audio digitally with EQ and reverb and all sorts of effects. We convert to digital media like compact discs and MP3s and all of this production is done in software and going through computers. I guess we still have microphones and preamps, but there's not a whole lot left. Uh, okay, uh, this, the second big area where we see computers and computation is musical instruments. So this includes everything from conventional looking keyboards, electronic, uh, electric pianos and organs and other, other keyboards, uh, drum machines, and then more esoteric instruments like in the lower left, this is the Linstrument uh, built by Roger Lin, which is sort of a guitar fretboard configuration with a touch sensitive uh, surface. Or in the lower right, the Sonic Spring by my colleague uh, Tomas Enriquez, which is a spring with lots of sensors. And if you um, go to the right labs around McGill, you'll find all sorts of other interesting instruments and sensors and uh, instrument systems. Okay, the third area is music distribution. So once again, this is just commonplace uh, how ev everyone gets music these days, but you don't have to go back very many years before uh, you see all kinds of other distribution mechanisms. You know, s you used to be able to walk into stores and browse through records. Uh, you used to uh, listen, you could listen to music on the radio. I mean, I guess you can still do that. But so much of, of our distribution now is network-based and um, and you know that's an increasing, even increasing trend. So I won't dwell on that. I'll say the, th the third area where, again, we've seen really a revolution in the last uh, 10 to 20 years is in music search and recommendation, uh, music fingerprinting. Yeah, not 20 years, just in the last 10 years probably at most. Uh, so I have some examples here, in the upper left is Google Music China, which is of course not known to us in the West or was n never available. Uh, it no longer even exists in China, but it was an interesting system uh, for two reasons. One reason is that uh, there was a, a way to search for music based on properties of the music that were actually identified by computation. So the computers would label music as having, um, uh, you know, being being exciting or, or fast or slow tempo or different uh, uh, moods or emotions and you could uh, sort of see these in two or three dimensions and uh, select things that were neighbors to things that you like and, and so on. And the second interesting thing is, is much of this work was done by uh, my student Ning Hu and you'll, you'll see some more of her work appear later. On the top right is uh, a little <laughs> kind of abstract depiction of music fingerprinting, which is the technology that allows you, if you hear a piece of music, you can uh, capture 10 or 15 seconds on a cell phone and transmit, transmit that to a service, which will then look up in a database of 10 to 20 million songs and tell you what you're listening to, which is pretty amazing technology. And another related technology is Pandora, which, is, which represents uh, a human labeling of musical attributes and algorithms that help us find similar music and music that we might, the system thinks we might be interested in listening to. Okay, so, so those are, I think, the uh, 
kind of summarize what the general public really knows about uh, music and computation and the technologies that have really gotten out into the world. And so what I want to talk about is the, the kind of stuff that, uh, that I do and many other people around the world do you know, in laboratories. It's experimental stuff. It's often oriented towards uh, esoteric uh, new music, contemporary music, uh, far away from the pop music in the general public. So that doesn't help the research become more visible. And um, so I'll, I'll present some of that. And so this, what I want to talk about are uh, computer accompaniment, style classification, score alignment, onset detection, and some new uh, forms of sound synthesis. And a lot of this stuff will be presented with video examples and uh, because of time limitations, I have to go through these things pretty quickly. So it'll be a very superficial survey of, of some technologies that are kind of emerging from research. And the first one of these I'm going to show is computer accompaniment, which is really how I got my start, I think, in uh, doing and presenting computer music research. And I'm going to let my video alter ego do the talking now. This is a demonstration of a computer accompaniment system. I'm going to begin by loading a file into the program. The file contains a score, and in the score, there's a part that I'm going to play on trumpet. That's also displayed on the screen. There's another part, which is an accompaniment part, in this case, composed quite some time ago. The purpose of the program, then, is to listen to my performance, a live performance of the solo part, and to synchronize the other parts and, and play them along with me. Now, I, I want to skip forward, and I'll, I'll skip some of the talking and just jump ahead to the uh, sort of torture test where I play lots of wrong notes and see what happens. So you can, to make the point that it's not just me playing along with the computer, the computer is, is following me. So that, that is work that was uh, actually done in the mid-80s, so we're, we're coming up on the 30th anniversary of uh, computer accompaniment uh, next year, I think, and uh, it's kind of amazing, you know, this technology, is, it's been around and other people work on this, and, uh, but, and, and I'll show some, some there's, there's been some uh, emergence into the commercial uh, public market, but anyway, here's, here's a, very quick description of what's going on there. We have uh, some input processing to detect pitches, in this case from the trumpet, and uh, part, of, part of what the program does is it looks for a match between what the trumpet is playing, uh, which of course is not always going to be perfect, it's not always going to be detected perfectly, uh, but a match between that and, so an approximate match between that and the score, and then based on that, uh, there's, there's a second part called accompaniment performance. And the, so the matching part 
I think I'll just gloss over this, is, is based on a uh, dynamic programming algorithm, and we'll skip the details. Uh, the, uh, uh, another interesting part of the program, and, and something I think a lot of other researchers haven't really focused on or quite come to terms with, is, is the performance part. So this is, this is the real musicianship. You know, it's not enough to just know where you are in the score and, and play that note. You have to know, you have to estimate what the performer is going to do and what their tempo is. And when they make changes, you have to change to synchronize with them, but you want to do it in a, in a musical way. And uh, at least in these early systems, we, had, we used a rule-based system and we actually assembled a lot of rules that kind of described what it, what it means to actually accompaniment, accompany someone. So for example, it, we could say if the, if the matcher is confident that the accompaniment is behind by a half second, then what do you do? You don't skip forward half a second because you might skip some notes. Uh, it might be very jarring to jump ahead a half second. So instead you speed up and so even though it will take you longer to synchronize, you'll, you'll have a more musical accompaniment and that's, it's, that trade-off is worth it. So those sorts of things go into the system. Um, one of the things that we tried to do uh, early on, in addition to accompanying instruments like trumpet, was uh, accompany polyphonic instruments like keyboards and also accompany the human voice, uh, which is a particularly a uh, difficult thing to accompany because when a computer is listening to a voice, it's, it's very hard to even know where the notes are. And because of vibrato and glissandi and just the kind of fluidity and continuity of the voice, it's, it's hard to define discrete symbols or discrete pitches to match against. Uh, but anyway, Lauren Grubb was a student of mine and his PhD work was uh, building a vocal accompaniment system, and I'll, I'll play a little of the result of that. So this is our accompaniment system playing piano. So that's uh, the piano that you hear is being played live by a computer. The only input to the computer is this microphone, and of course the uh, a machine readable score that says what the accompaniment notes are and what the solo notes are. asked for some, some very, um, uh, or fairly dramatic tempo changes. So if you listen carefully, you know, you will hear some deliberate tempo changes to kind of drive the computer slower and Just a word about how this works, for, especially for any computer scientists that are here. Um, unlike the previous systems where score position was modeled by, in terms of discrete notes and matching notes, this system, the score position is modeled by a probability density function. So we can think of score, if, if we made score position continuous, just continuous time, we have some curve that's estimated by the computer to say, well, that there's a very high likelihood of, that we're here in the score, uh, some indication maybe that we're back here in the score and low probability elsewhere. And we use a Bayesian update rule. So this is a, a probabilistic view that says, um, in, in as simple terms as I can make this, uh, the 
what we're trying to do is estimate the position in the score based on observations, like you know, what pitches are, we, are, are being sung, what onset information do we have, what's, what phonemes seem to be sung. So we make these observations and we want to predict where we are in the score. And Bayes' rule is this, this magic uh, formula that says uh, that that's really equivalent to estimating the opposite, the estimating what output, what's the probability of making this observation given that you are at this location in the score multiplied by some probability that you're in the score. And so uh, we, can, we can solve the first part, what's the probability of the observation based on the score, just by actually getting people to sing things and, and doing statistics, counting. You know, we say every time there's a G, what's the probability that we actually observe a G? How often do we observe a G sharp? Uh, uh, how often do we observe some other pitch? And so those gives a, give us some probabilities. And then the probability of uh, being at some position in the score is based on prior knowledge. So, you know, if, if, this is, if this graph represents where we were, let's say, 50 milliseconds ago, then you would expect that whole curve to sort of slide forward by 50 milliseconds, uh, you know, scaled by the tempo. And, uh, well, and so, so we do that, we compute all these things, and we constantly update this probability. And it actually works really well. Um, this was commercialized in the 90s by a company that, uh, sort of changed names a few times, so it's now makemusic.com, uh, and uh, Make Music is uh, marketing a product for education, primarily, uh, that makes practicing more fun uh, by allowing students to, to play along with accompaniment by band or orchestra or piano or whatever it is that they're trying to learn. And I'll, I'll play just a little bit of it. This was one of our early uh, sort of promotional videos. It's, it's, it's dated, but you'll see why I'm playing it. How can Vivace follow you? First, it listens to you through a microphone so that it can hear even your most subtle tempo changes as you sing or play. Then its patented technology determines the most musically satisfying way to follow you. Finally, it plays the accompaniment accurately and in the appropriate style. Now, all of this is happening so fast you feel like you're playing with a very good human accompanist. To demonstrate this, Chisato will play the second movement of Creston's Sonata. Okay, so obviously, you know, if you're a trumpet player and Wynton Marcellus is pushing your technology, it's, uh, it's great. So <laughs> I just had to show that. Um, a lot of, when, when I was working on accompaniment, a lot of people ask about uh, improvisation. And they would say, well, what, what happens if you uh, play something that's not in the score? And unfortunately, the answer was pretty boring. Um, if, if you don't play what's written in the score, there's no match. The accompaniment has no idea what to do because it's entirely guided by position and synchronization. So, you know, it either stops or it plays and ignores you, but there's nothing else you could do. But that did make me think about um, what's going on in accompaniment. What kinds of music understanding are, are needed in uh, improvisation? And one of the things that happens in improvisation is that uh, musicians uh, sort of pick up on the level of energy and styles of playing, and you expect a rhythm section to um, interact with you as a performer and support what you're trying to do, which means they have to understand and recognize what you're doing. And so we thought it would be interesting to build a system that could listen and recognize jazz styles. And I'll play a little... Um, example uh, demo for this work. So what I'm doing is playing trumpet. The computer is listening to the trumpet and every, it, it looks at the previous five seconds and makes a choice of what style it thinks that I'm playing, ha having been trained on a bunch of examples. 
And so I'll just, let me play this. it always detects it within five seconds, so there we go. <laughs> uh, so the, the technology behind this is uh, really a classic uh, machine learning uh, problem. We extract features from the audio, like the note density, means and standard deviation of pitch range over these five second windows, and lots of other features. And um, then we use some standard computer science techniques uh, like naive Bayesian classifiers, linear classifiers, neural networks. Uh, these are standard machine learning algorithms that are able to take these training examples and produce programs that automatically uh, do recognition. Uh, it's, it's half magic and half kind of math and half statistics. And one, one interesting thing about this is I had previously been trying to actually hand code some algorithms to recognize some different styles for uh, an interactive performance piece that I was working on. And I just could not make anything that was consistently reliable because every time I would code up some rule for something, you know, I would go off in performance and break the rule or just play faster. But, but these machine learning techniques are, tend to be very robust and uh, really solve that problem. Um, Another thing I thought I would show you is uh, audio to score alignment. So this is just another kind of music understanding task of um, kind of basic musicianship. You know, we all learn to, when we're listening to recordings or live performances, to open up an orchestral score and follow along in the score. And, and that matching requires, you know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of skills and a lot of musicianship. It's something that computers should be able to do, we think, uh, and this, this work was introduced um, around uh, 2000 uh, or in that time frame, and th the, way, the way this works, it's related to the computer accompaniment work that I showed earlier, but the main difference is now we're able to do things like listen to an entire orchestra or uh, commercial recording, you know, polyphony, drums, everything, vocals going on at once. And so it required uh, some new representation uh, techniques. And we're actually using something that's related to the spectrum. It's, it's very general, but uh, tailored to music. And so for people that know about chromograms, that's what I'm talking about. And uh, the solution is you, you build a matrix like this in which the, um, in this case, audio is horizontal dimension and uh, the, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, okay, the, the audio input is vertical dimension, the symbolic input is a horizontal dimension, and these little dots in here, black and white, represent the similarity uh, uh, between what you're observing from the score and what you're observing from the uh, from the audio recording. And so this is one of our first examples. This is the first movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. And uh, we, we got this graph back, and the white line here indicates sort of the best path, so the best overall match, uh, matching sequence from beginning to end. And when I looked at this, I said, wow, well, at least it's on the diagonal pretty much. Um, it doesn't actually end up at the upper right-hand corner, which is good because the audio recording had a long reverb tail, and it actually does go longer than the, than the actual score. But there was this little glitch here in the middle, and I thought, oh, it looks like either something's going wrong or there's something really interesting there. So if we go and look at it, um, some of you may guess what this glitch is, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, uh, but let me play 
Here's from the acoustic recording. And then here's our, uh, you know, symbolic direct from the score MIDI representation uh, synthesized. So, so you can hear that, that, that um, you know, the human oboist in playing that cadenza really milked it for all it was worth and, and uh, took his time. And that's why the slope here changes because relative to the rest of the symphony, uh, there was kind of a dramatic slowdown. And that, in, in a way, that the fact that that feature popped out kind of confirms that this thing is really faithfully matching and tracking. Uh, we've actually incorporated this into Audacity, although only, currently only in an experimental version. But, but there is a, uh, if, if you know how to get it, you can get a version of Audacity where uh, you, can, you can load in a score. And, I mean, you can load in a MIDI file, you can load in uh, audio, and you can click the Align menu, and it will actually warp the MIDI uh, down here on the bottom to line up with the audio. So now, as you can see, these things are lined up. There's a big orchestral 2D right here, and you can sort of see it in the audio, and you can see that it matches. Sorry, you can see it in the MIDI and see that it matches in the audio. And other things that are much more difficult to discern in the audio, like what's going on here, uh, you can see these, these trills, uh, or actually, I guess those are sixteenth notes, da 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 But you can kind of now look for features visually to navigate through audio. So that's one application. Um, another sort of musical listening problem that humans are really good at and computers are not so good at is finding note onsets. Um, how, do we, how do we actually segment audio into discrete notes? And there are lots of applications of that, including things like score following, but also uh, beat tracking, um, just other kinds of music uh, listening. We'll see some applications later to uh, synthesis. And I want to just play some results. This was uh, output from a machine learning uh, algorithm that we developed for onset labeling that just kind of, I think, shows where the state of the art is now. So what, what we're hearing is this is me playing trumpet. The computer has, um, has not actually trained on this audio. It trained on some different trumpet playing. And it's inserted clicks at the note onsets. And this is without a score. Um, and OK. So, so very accurate timing, uh, very precise. And you might say, well, how hard is that? But this is, this is actually what this audio looks like. Um, if you looked at this visually, you see all these things and you say, well, is that an onset? Well, no, it turns out to be just amplitude vibrato. And uh, there are other, other features like, you know, where actually is the attack in this blur? And there are other, other places where you know, amplitude never actually goes down to zero. There's just an attack or a slur or some, some continu continuous sound coming out of the trumpet, and yet our ears are very good at finding out where the notes are. Uh, moving on to one, I think maybe this is the uh, last example. Um, this is at least related to music understanding, but it's part going the other direction, music synthesis. Uh, we would like to be able to have uh, computers perform expressively. And people have worked on this problem, you know, since the beginning of computer music in the, in the 50s. You know, how do we make computers actually make music as opposed to sound? And in the early days, and actually continuing up through today, there's, there's kind of an assumption that if you want to make music with a computer, or a machine, you can decompose music like engineers like to decompose problems. So you decompose music into uh, the problem of synthesizing notes. And then the, the assumption is, if, if I can just make a note, if I can make one good note, then 
I can synthesize all the notes of a piece of music, and then I, all I have to do is put them together. So that's the classic engineering, decompose the problem, solve the sub-problems, and then put it back together to make the big solution. And, it, and the problem of doing that with music is it's just a bad idea, and it doesn't work. So, um, and I don't know why it's taken our community, you know, 50 years, and we still haven't really figured this out, but that's... Uh, so I should probably give some examples to back that up. Um, but the, the key idea is that music is really not built out of individual notes. It's built out of phrases. And um, if you ask somebody, how do you play a note, it turns out a musician cannot actually play a single note the way they would play it in the context of a musical phrase. So here, for example, are some uh, amplitude envelopes of trumpet tones exactly the same tone, exactly the same duration, player, microphone, everything's the same except context. So here's a tongued note, you know, ta, 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 and here's a slurred note, ta. And the slurring looks nothing like the tongue note, so, uh, you know, that's just a simple example of context. And I think I'll just jump down, here's uh, Ning Hu's name again. She just finished her uh, doctoral dissertation on building what I like to call a synthesizer synthesizer just because it's, it's so hard to say. But what it, what it means is that her, her system listens to musical performances by real musicians. Um, from that information, it, it creates or it synthesizes a musical synthesizer and then you can put new scores, music, into the synthesizer and it will perform very much in the style and characteristics of the training data that you gave it. So here's Ning's uh, synthesizer synthesizer uh, creating a trumpet performance that was based on me as a model. And I wish I could play so cleanly, but here it is. Okay, so maybe not perfect, and maybe if you listen carefully, you might notice that it's not a human playing, but there's a lot of music in there, I think, and I think, I, I hope you'll agree. And uh, here's a, the same system, just to kind of prove that it's fairly general, and again, it's this is kind of the first version, I'm sure there can be many improvements, but this is the uh, same system, but the input was a bassoon, and we're, we're going to play some bassoon music. So the computer learned articulation, it learned phrasing, it learned vibrato, and it's actually kind of learning to be a musician. Uh, so that's so that's the research I wanted to show you. Um, we could spend another four hours looking at more stuff, but I want to spend a, a few minutes talking about this idea of maybe what music might be like in the future, and this is uh, my current focus now. And the big idea is what I call human computer music performance. Uh, up until now, uh, lots of music research, signal processing, building real-time systems and interactive systems, it's all of the stuff happening in these labs around the world, um, including McGill, is very much, very often dedicated towards uh, fairly, making fairly esoteric art music. And, um, and I think that's great, so don't get me wrong. Uh, uh, and there's quite a, a widespread practice, but it's, uh, there's relatively little sophistication or application of these techniques in popular music. So I think that creates a, a big opportunity that our whole computer music uh, community has largely missed out on, which is building state-of-the-art computer music systems for popular music performance. And um, in particular, building autonomous, intelligent machine musicians. So to show you that in another way, for example, suppose you wanted to get together and play music, but you're missing, let's say, a bass player. You know, the, here's so so you can't play, uh, so you can't play. So what if 
you could just go to your digital music stand and push the bass button and uh, a menu would pop up and say, well, you know, what bass player would you like to play with? I'll just download him for you and, and you can start playing music. So that's kind of the vision, that's the big idea. Uh, so what would it take to actually realize that? Well, if you're going to play popular music, synchronization is a really big problem and a big issue. Uh, there's, you know, we did synchronization and score following, but that's because we had scores. Uh, rock music, people don't actually notate detailed timing and strumming patterns or, or drumming or anything else. So score following doesn't really work. Uh, current research in beat detection or in, uh, 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 yeah, so beat tracking is not reliable enough to really go on stage and, re and depend on. So big problems there. Music notation is very sketchy and um, I'll just leave it at that. So big representation issues. Uh, there, as I said, popular music is full of improvisation. Not only the, you know, the Charlie Parker, Miles Davis uh, jazz improvisation, uh, but there's improvisation of chord voicings, there's improvisation of strumming patterns, of drumming. Uh, everything is sort of unpredictable. There are big questions of sound production. You know, how do we, uh, how do we make computers sound really good? Uh, good enough that, that live musicians would really want to play with them. There are big computer science modularity systems building issues of, you know, musicians right now can, I think are pretty good at plugging in microphones to mixers and mixers to amplifiers and amplifiers to speakers. You know, we have these modular sound systems that sort of everybody uh, can work with. So I think for this, uh, human computer music performance to become real, we need modular musician systems. We need, uh, uh, we need modules that, that know where you are in the score. We need modules that can display and interact with live musicians. We need modules that, that do arranging, that do performing, and, and people are gonna have to be able to just plug them together, which is a you know, big software nightmare. And there are human computer interaction issues all over the place. You know, how do we actually communicate with these machines while we're simultaneously trying to play instruments and keep our eyes on the audience and sing and jump up and down and all the other things that we do. So uh, there's, interestingly, uh, a pretty large market. I have some numbers from the United States that even if you exclude recordings, education, and performance, there's an $8 billion U.S. music uh, sales volume, 5 million musical instruments per year. Uh, performance is also about 10 billion. Recording revenue is about 10 billion. Approximately half of U.S. households have a practicing musician, so that means there's easily $10 billion and 100 million people in the United States alone that you know, are potentially interested in something like this. So, you know, if you capture 1% of the market, that's more than all computer music research in, the, in North America, probably. Uh, <laughs> so here's one, ex one example of uh, something kind of moving in that direction. This is a little company I've been working with called Music Prodigy, and I want to play a, a piece of video here. Rock Prodigy. Rock Prodigy is a bit like Guitar Hero, except with using an actual guitar. It uses a tablature system, and it's a free download from the App Store. It's available today. You can download fully mastered original recordings for $2.99 a song and learn how to play starting in easy mode and inching your way on up to Prodigy. Currently, there are about 30 songs available for in-app purchase with more coming every day. You can play Metallica, Leonard Skinner, Allman Brothers Band, Paramore, and even more. In the app, you can choose from performance or practice mode. In practice mode, you can pause the song so you can rewind and practice the section over again. You can set it so that it goes one note at a time so you can really break it down. You can even turn on chord names and note names so you can learn exactly what note you're playing while you're playing, say, fret three on string five. In performance mode, you're just rocking out to the song. The best part of the app is that it uses polyphonic pitch detection, which means while I can play it using you know, my electric guitar plugged in using an iRig or some other compatible device into the iPad so that it can record my notes, I can also just play my acoustic guitar and it'll be recorded using the onboard mic to tell me if I'm playing the right note or if it's not quite right. Rock Prodigy is available for... 
Okay, so um, <laughs> uh, we, we just released a uh, vocal version and uh, we're, we're targeting uh, sort of singers and choir market to help uh, choir members learn, uh, learn their parts. And, and one thing I wanted to point out because this was an unsolicited uh, comment, she said the best part about it is polyphonic pitch detection. So that's what I did for the project and <laughs> I was, I was so, so pleased, I mean, not, it's rare in the press for somebody to even pronounce something like that. <laughs> um, here's another example of, of human computer music performance. This is kind of a large scale thing that we did at Carnegie Mellon with a 20 piece string orchestra being played uh, in kind of virtually by computer. It's actually a 20 track recording and we're taking the, that those 20 tracks of audio and in real time we're time stretching to speed up and slow down and conform the, st the strings to uh, a live jazz ensemble. And my only excuse, I know there are a lot of string players in the audience including a good friend of mine, but uh, uh, you know, one excuse is, is we never could have gotten uh, even fit all those string players on the stage and uh, they probably turn up their noses at this jazz band, but uh, anyway, here's, here they are playing together. So you can hear the strings up, up high. Spatially, uh, it really sounded terrific. So now the band comes in, you hear the string plays. So, so the great thing about this is the band is not wearing headphones, there's no click track, they can take the tempo they want, uh, things can get excited and speed up like they do, and everybody can play together. Um, another, uh, well, so, so one other thing that this is going to require is, uh, to be successful, I think, is some uh, kind of collaboration on putting music together. You know, what are these computers going to play? And, and I think uh, we're already seeing things moving in that direction. So this is Wikiphonia, which I just discovered. Um, it's a kind of online collaborative uh, system for creative content. and. Uh, you know, here's, here's a tune, what's new, it, it uh, has a link to the composer and the lyricist, there's machine readable music, you can, you can go up here and actually transpose it to whatever key your instrument reads music in. Uh, there, there's a link to an audio recording, the, even the album cover of the Sinatra uh, version of this tune, so, and, and people can go in and update this website and make corrections to the music and I think something like that on steroids would allow people to start uploading bass parts and, and violin sections and you know, who knows how people could collaborate this way. So um, let, me, let me skip ahead. I want to play one more example. Uh, this is, oh, it's over here. Uh, no? It's over here. So this is uh, a quartet that I play in, and uh, what you're gonna hear here is uh, human computer music performance, where the computer is playing some horn parts to sort of augment my trumpet parts. Uh, so here we go. One, two.
let me stop it there. So what's going on here is I'm, I'm actually tapping my foot and that's where the tempo's coming from and I'm wearing a little uh, uh, sensor, capacitive sensor on my hand so that I can give cues to the computer and it's, it's all you know, pretty invisible and pretty seamless. Uh, I also wanted to point out this, sort of in the background here, the lighting's not so good, but that, that cellist is my son. So I not only build computer music systems, I build human music systems. <laughs> Uh, okay, so, so just to uh, wrap up, uh, music understanding and human-computer music performance, I believe, will enrich musical experiences for millions of people if we can just get this stuff out there and make it usable. And I think it's a really interesting possibility is that, you know, just like the electric guitar, uh, sort of went from an amplified guitar to a whole new art form, and just like cameras went from being a cheap way to make portraits to uh, a fine art discipline, I think that human uh, computer music performance can take on a life of its own and attract uh, musicians and experimentation and, and uh, sort of change, uh, well, create new genres of music and uh, that some really great music can be made that way. And I think that's in the, at least in the future of music performance. Thank you very much.